but um, I've got three hours of content from Black Hat that I've boiled down to 40 to 45 minutes with a lot of demos. And I want to give, uh, make this talk really interactive and give you a lot of value. So if you guys don't mind, I want to start a little early. Is that okay? All right. So uh, how many of you code review or look at code and try to find vulnerabilities? All right. Good. You're going to enjoy this talk. All right. When you look at web frameworks, you've got to understand at a basic level the data flow. All right. And what we're talking about today is looking at these components that are pictured here. Every web framework follows a similar pattern to this. So there's some entry point which then figures out from the URL some action class or some logic that's going to be executed and call some method on that class. That class is then going to talk to some model API, get the data, get the data that's going to be viewed and, and the objects that are going to encapsulate that data and then transport that data to some type of rendering technology that's going to display the data for viewing. All right? This is the basic pattern. We're going to go through an actual app, and you're going to be able to look at code. Then we're going to find some vulnerabilities together. All right, before we get started, one of the basic things that you've got to understand when you're code reviewing is the con concept of concatenation. Right? If you look at every single data flow vulnerability, what's involved? Concatenation, right? They're concatenating into a SQL statement. They're concatenating into HTML. They're concatenating into a file path. So you got to know when you're, when you're code reviewing whatever application, all the crazy ways that they can concatenate untrusted data into something that's going to be vulnerable. All right, let's talk SQL injection real quick. Every framework out there is going to use some type of SQL injection uh, data framework. Hibernate, JPA, some type of uh, active record. So when you're looking for SQL injection type vulnerabilities in these APIs, you're looking for concatenation, but into things that look like SQL. Now, I put here a couple keywords that you can use when you're looking through your code, query, find, execute. There are going to be typical areas where you have SQL injection in these ORMs, or Object Relational Mapping Frameworks. All right, and then you have these weird cases like Ibatis down there. All right, now we talk about command injection. Every one of these web frameworks has some type of expression language that they use to render data back to the user. Okay, in this particular case, we're looking at .NET MVC. And here we're looking at Razor. All right? Now, when we look at question user input in red to the right, if that comes from a user, then what they can do with Razor is they can use the ampersand curly brace to execute arbitrary code. So let's take a look at that. So here, if they pass in ampersand curly brace, any C-sharp code will then be executable on the server. All right, anything in there? All right, let's also talk about other, other frameworks. Other frameworks besides .NET use other types of scripting languages, and they're called EL. So Struts and Spring have EL, and in older versions of struts, they would take request parameters like order.orderline.quantity and evaluate that as an expression. So that translates into request.getAttributeOrder.getOrderline.setQuantity equal to 10. Do you see how that code, that, that little string there, order.orderline.quantity, gets translated into that? Now, if you look down below that, the guys in the links down here figured out a way to execute arbitrary commands on the server using that same logic. So that there, the at signs say, call the exit method on the system class and execute the exit method, causing a denial of service for your server, right? All right, parameter tampering. Every framework is going to try to help the developers out to be more productive, right? And what do we have here? If you look at the browser URL, what is it going to look like? You're going to say www.server.com slash loan ID equals some value, right? 
So what do you see here? What can they do? Anybody? They can change what? Params is a request parameter. So what do, they, what do you think they're going to do on the URL? They're going to change the number from 123 to 234, 567, and see whose loan app comes up and what kind of information they can get, right? All right, so you, don't, you, want, to, you want to look for that and tell the developers to do what's on the bottom, which is limit to some certain extent what loan IDs are valid so that the only loan IDs they can see are the ones that are related to the user themselves. All right? All right. There's a lot of redirects or different ways that frameworks can do redirects, OK? When you're looking at frameworks, you got to know all these ways because these can be used as phishing attack points into the application. They can be used by external users to trick and fool their users into going to the website, but really going to their website and then exfiltrating their user credentials, right? So you got to be familiar with all the different ways that apps can redirect. Then we talk about file disclosure. So all these things basically allow you to look at any file on the server. Now, does anyone know anything about the web INF directory in Java apps? What's it supposed to be? Anybody know? Can you access it from the outside? No. Right, you can't, right? But what does this file disclosure do? It allows you to access any of the files that are supposedly protected under WebINF. So you can start looking at your configuration files. You can start executing arbitrary protected JSPs. So you have to be familiar with the different ways that the framer can do a server-side redirect. If you find this, where if any of that stuff in red is controlled by the user, then the attacker can, can see any file on the server. So let's, let's go through a demo. All right, I know. All right, so let's take a look. All right. This is a configuration file for struts, all right? And what we're doing is we're saying when the user types in slash server redirect, we want them to call this action class. Everybody got me that far? And inside that action class, there's going to be an execute method, because that's how struts works. When you say call this action, by default, they say, OK, call the execute method. Now, when we look down here, and we see there's two results. The results say, in that picture we had before, after the logic is finished executing, where do you go to or which view component are you going to invoke? Now here, if the action method returns success, you're going to go to slash web inf slash test.html, right? Not a big deal. But if you look at the next one for test, it returns to X URL, a dynamic variable. Now, if X URL is controlled by the attacker, then they can go where? Anywhere, thank you. Anywhere on the server. Now, let's look and see if X URL is controlled by the attacker. OK, so this is the code for the action, all right? In struts2, any public getter and setter method inside the action is settable via request parameters. So here, XURL is something that can be set via request parameter. Now, we have two methods here, execute and some internal method. Execute is called by default. Some internal method is not. But struts2 has a trick that'll allow you to execute that some internal method. So let's go ahead and take a look at how you do that. All right. So here's server redirect, right? Can everybody read that? At the very, okay, good. So 
If I call this server redirect, it calls the execute method, which returns success. It takes me to this static file here, which says, this is the success page for server it, redirect, right? Right here. Now, if I want to call that internal method, here, some internal method. There's a trick in struts too that they try to do to try to help the developers out to make stuff easier. You know, instead of having one action for every single thing, you can have multiple methods in a single action. All right, so how do we do that? Let's go back here and let's use the exclamation. What? Oh. Let's use the exclamation and let's call the method. So what, what struts too is they give you this kind of like alternate way to call methods in an action. All right. So now we're going to call this method and we're going to take a look remotely at the web XML file. Okay? So we just accessed a protected directory that's supposed to not be accessible remotely because somebody left a file disclosure with untrusted data. All right? Now, we can do even worse things, but let's, let's just go from there. So, so everybody understand file disclosure, right? Any file on the, the file system, if the server is configured for directory browsing, we can actually see what files are there on the server, right? All right, so let's go back to the presentation. All right, so I explained that. Now, Spring MVC has some kind of peculiarities. So they take the untrusted data and tack a prefix and a suffix. Now, I got a question for you guys, for the hackers out there. How would you get around this? So you control the stuff in red, but let's say you don't want to execute a JSP, you want to execute some other file extension. Anyone? What? What? No byte. No byte might work, but actually I don't think it works on Java, but on PHP for sure. Good, good choice. So what's another alternative? Hash. Uh, yes, that'll work. I forgot about that. Good job. So what, what I did was um, another weird thing, just to give you guys some other stuff in your toolbox, the semicolon. Does anyone know what the semicolon does in a URL? It's an obscure portion of the HTTP URL spec. It is a path, HTTP path parameter, anything after that. All right, so try it out. Use it, see what you get. All right, and uh, by the way, just to give you reference on this file disclosure, uh, Dennis Cruz and Ryan Berg had a paper that discussed this a while ago. They, it, they, those are excellent guys. Um, all right, next thing. When you review code, you need to know for cross-site scripting what tags do not encode output and what tags do encode output and what type of output encoding they use and what characters do they output, right? So here is an example of inherently dangerous outputting functions or tags that don't do any encoding. So you have to be familiar with every framework's tags and output tags that don't encode. Do some experimentation. All right, these are tags, these are ways that developers go, you know, this output encoding really messes up my HTML, so I'm going to turn it off. So you have to also look for this because some code, some tags will output encode by default. But then the developers go and turn that off. So they just make themselves um, vulnerable again. All right. Finally, there are tags that do encode. But depending on where the output goes, it might be useless. So for example, all these tags do HTML encoding. But HTML encoding in an event handler or in a URL won't do anything. The browser automatically reverse encodes it at runtime and sends it off to be executed. Oops. All right, let's talk about mass assignment because mass assignment I know has been getting a lot of attention. But believe me, the, the more I do my research, 
the more I see it everywhere. So I don't want to give the website name, but they were, they were compromised through a mass assignment vulnerability, right? And they were, it was a server side vulnerability. But what I'm finding is mass assignment not only exists at the server side, but in your REST APIs and even in the client side frameworks. So let's take a look at an example. Let's first take a look at the code so you understand what's going on. All right, we have a person action. And if you look here at the very bottom, there's a save method, right? And when you look at the save method, you think, oh, I'm just saving a single person, right? I'm just saving to the person. Okay, everybody believe that? Is there a way to save to other tables if I just save to the person? Can I save to customers or can I save to orders or? Actually, you can. Uh, let's take a look. So this person object in Java is a entity object. So let's take a look at this person object. Can anyone notice something kind of special in the attributes of the person? It has a reference to what? So. I'll give you a hint. These are pretty simple, right? But this, this type right here, this type, OK, first of all, oh, let me give you a little hint on how you know this is a, uh, a model object can be persisted. In JPA, you put an annotation, which I've highlighted, dot .entity. And that means that this object is representing a database table. All right? Now, here we have a user object. Oh. Huh. So uh, I can update the person. But can I update the user? Anyone know? Maybe, right? OK, so the way I would know if I can update it is if it has a public getter and setter, right? And it does. So that means when I persist the person object, I can also persist any of its relations all the way through. So let's take a look at that and actually try it out, right? If you guys don't believe me, let's, let's actually try it out. All right. So we have this update page, all right? This is updating the person. Remember, we only had three fields. It's a simple person table. OK, but let me give you a little background on it. This is the form that's being displayed, OK? Now, I've, I've put in these hidden fields to, to indicate what you can do as a pen tester when you're fuzzing these type of forms to test for this stuff. So if you look here, the stuff over here are those two fields that are displayed. But if you look here, now I'm, I'm, I'm attacking what? That reference, right? I'm attacking the user, and if the user is atta attached to a profile, I can even go that far and start updating other aspects, right? So here I put in a bunch of dummy data. And let's take a look at the database before so we can uh, make sure that, that I'm uh, up on the up and up, all right? So this is that one table person, all right? That's what we're updating. There's uh, Bob Johnson and Matt Rabel, and then there's two records in here, right? All right. This is in the, the user table. Oops, sorry. OK, so let's, let's change this to All right, so I've just saved it. Now, the user doesn't know anything different, right? Well, let's, like, let's take a look at the data. I'm going to refresh this view. Oh. We just got a third row here. Ooh, whoa. So I can start arbitrarily adding additional records to a database, right? From something that wasn't expected to be adding. And uh, just to show you the person table, we did modify that user, right? So I was just persisting that one object person. But magically, through this auto request binding and through the 
the frameworks, the database frameworks, I was able to update anything it's related to. Okay? All right. Um, I don't have a lot of time, so I'm going to kind of skip on the mass assignment history. I think the point was made, right? Um, all right. So mass assignment doesn't just exist in web frameworks. The more I look around, what mass assignment is pretty scary. It's actually in, in almost everything because there's this basic pattern developers are trying to use, which is they want to make it easy. So they say, okay, I'm going to do this dynamic binding. You give me something and I'm going to magically map it over to these model objects for you so you don't have to do that manually. So I'm going to introduce um, a new uh, person, Frank. He joined our team recently. He's our .NET expert, and he's going to show you some interesting things that are going to affect all .NET applications that are REST-based and using the web API. All right, uh, Frank? Hello. Let me give you a second to set up. Ha, it works. Hello, everybody. Uh, just a what I'm going to talk about is um, REST, and then I have a couple of demos, and then my personal thoughts. So, what is REST? It's basically a um, REST is basically an idea where you have URLs which are representative of the what you're trying to write to. Um, I had something cool to say, but I was looking at Wikipedia, but I forgot it. It's all right. So I think most people here will probably know what REST is. And so two sort of thoughts I uh, want to talk about is why and uh, what exactly, why we, people are want to do REST. And the idea is that interop is a real uh, pain in the rear end. And um, to just, just get any service set up with something non-REST, you have a lot of configs, you have a lot of manual wiring, and a lot of, you got to understand a lot of boilerplate code. And people say, forget this. Let's just go with REST. And it's a really easy way to expose um, my data in a database to the rest of the world. Um, and REST is getting very, very popular. It seems like it's the way that any uh, website or web service like Google or Yahoo or Microsoft or whoever uh, is going to use to expose their data services to the rest of the world for like, you know, mashable websites or whatever. Um, what was my next point going to be? <laughs> Sorry, my coworker asked me just uh, yesterday to uh, speak, so I'm a little bit unprepared. Oh, so sort of the old way of uh, sort of wiring up a wiring up a web service or something to a database would be uh, a lot of configs. Sorry, the the old way of wiring um, the old way of wiring like uh, some protocol, let's say, on your a JavaScript app to a website would be to uh, define your data format, contracts, and then so on and so forth. And that's really manual and tedious. And sort of a new way now is through uh, mass assignment is to use auto binding where the framework will magically figure out, hmm, the parameters is coming on, the, the parameters that are coming through the wire is, has these fields, and I'm trying to assign them to this object which has also these fields. And so the framework will magically wire up uh, request parameters to object fields for you and then call your function with that, um, with that magically newed up object. And so I have a couple demos that I want to show. And these are a little bit last minute, so they might or might not work. The first one is. Um, So just to give you a little bit of background, this little app I've written is a really, really, really simple app. And I use uh, ASP.NET MVC. And the idea is that you have this form here. Um, and the form will talk JSON 
to the web servers to sort of save a, a new username and a, a new user ID and a new username. And the list of users, uh, the most updated list of users will show up here. So just a quick demo. Let's hope this works. Ah, it works. Did I type four? I type one. Oh, okay. And just to give you an idea, the post parameters are where to go. Basically, I have a. Uh, if you guys can see this, I have basically the app. When I click save, it posts some data to the web server, and it has a post data of ID equals something and uh, name equals Frank. And on the website. I have a new user object with uh, ID equals this and name equals an ID and a string, an ID and a name field, and that gets called to a user controller. Uh, sorry, a controller function which does the saving. Now, uh, as Abe, my coworker, mentioned, uh, some website had the bright idea of okay, this is the part that might or might not work. Some website had the bright idea of adding another. Um, field to the, like, let me just clear this out. S some website had the bright idea of adding an uh, is admin field to their objects, sorry, to their user um, sort of struct. And then try to keep the old interface, but make sure, you know, if you probably don't know about this new is admin, you probably won't uh, sort of use it because, um, okay. They added a new field, is admin, and they kept the sort of the wire protocol all the same. But someone discovered um, this new is admin field, and we're sort of going to replay the incident here. And I was gonna, hoping to demo it for you. So this is the part that might not work. So in my model object, I'm going to add this new field called is admin, and what? Oh, oops, wrong place. And so uh, my database will now have a new, the database, oh, come on. Oh, okay, the demo didn't work. Okay, I was hoping to add the new is admin field and then show you how the wire protocol between the app is still the same and then I was going to add a, uh, to use curl to uh, sort of manually add that field to the, um, sort of fake a query that adds the field and have it show up in a database, but that didn't work. Okay, next demo. Uh, this is the one. Okay. The next demo is uh, a lot of people use, instead of JSON for their wire protocol, they use XML for their wire protocol between, um, between, the, between like a web service and an app. And one of the more interesting, uh, so can anyone tell me what they think is one of the inherent problems with using XML as a wire protocol, especially in the .NET framework? Do we have any, uh, what kind of vulnerabilities exist just inherent in using uh, XML as a wire protocol? XML entity injection. So I have a demo here. This one actually I know for sure works. And so this is an app that I found on the, just sort of a demo app. And uh, one of the functionalities is that you can add a new uh, sort of customer to a. And so if I add, uh, let's say. We have a new customer because we, the app will post an XML payload to the server 
the server persists in the database, and it, uh, we can see it here. Now, one of the interesting uh, vulnerabilities that exists is called XML entity injection. And the idea of entity, XML entity injection is that uh, through some XML magic, you can sort of reference an external thing. So in this case, I have I, I defined an external entity called include, and that's sourced from a file on my system. And then I use it here as part of the payload to my sort of as a I reference he it here in one of the fields of the payload. And just to show you how this works. We're going to use the uh, and post back to customers. And so basically, uh, it's really easy to make the mistake where you don't uh, validate your XML to make sure that the external entity does not exist. And then so they can theoretically go and read any file off your system. And so the idea is that uh, the idea is that it's really easy to not validate that there's an external entity in your payload, and that gets referenced somehow in the hacker payload, and it gets written out to the database, and then, boom! All of a sudden, your file contents are sort of like reflected back onto your website. In this case, so and just some random thoughts. Uh, the whole idea of conventions over configuration is going to get more and more popular. And the, um, the second thought I had was accessibility for developers. Accessibility as in like, you know, we have all these automagic ways of doing things. Uh, it solves certain problems and it causes other problems. And it's sort of uh, these accessibility or making things easier and easier for the app application developer to get things done or for the user to interface with some website will, uh, is always in tension with security because they can exploit these a framework does this thing for you automatically in ways that you don't understand. That's all I have. Great job, Frank. All right, so um, we're going to continue talking. Um, or I'm, okay, thank you. All right, so one thing, um, just to, to stress on the point on the RESTful mass assignment that he showed you, every single web API REST.NET MVC implementation is vulnerable to that entity injection attack. He didn't really straight that, uh, stress that, but every single implementation of a REST API on .NET MVC that uses web API and accepts, accepts XML is going to be vulnerable to that. So you can not only just get files, you can, start, you can start pulling the network and seeing what hosts are inside the network. You can use the HTTP protocol. You can look for files. You can start doing a lot of other bad stuff, right? So when you're code reviewing code, that's one of the first things you want to look for when you're looking at .NET REST APIs is are they using web API, all right? Because that's a problem. And you will need to implement an interceptor to stop that from happening, all right? All right, so let's talk about client base. So we talked about server. We talked about REST. Now we're looking at the client, OK? Now, the reason why client-based mass assignment exists is because all these JavaScript frameworks now are coming out. And they're thinking, when I create these applications with a bunch of JavaScript, it turns into spaghetti code real fast. So I need to do something to organize this code. And they're all familiar with MVC, right? MVC on the server is just proliferating, and they say, oh, okay, well, I'll just put the same pattern on the client, right? So they have in JavaScript, JS stands for JavaScript, they have JavaScript models, JavaScript controllers, and JavaScript views. And all that's passed between the client JavaScript and the server components is JSON and XML, back and forth. But the model is a mirror image of the model on the server. So those two are kind of inherently linked. So whatever you do on the client, and the same attacks that you used for the server can be done on the client. So if you want to take a look at some sample code, this is what it looks like. 
So this particular case is Spine. I don't know how many people are familiar with Spine as the JS framework for the view components. Okay. Ah. Okay. Four. Oh. Sh um. All right. So I've got five minutes. So I wanted to. Um, talk okay. So this is just a reference chart for identifying mass assignment in the different frameworks and languages. When you have time, review this. This is um, how you would mitigate it. Okay. Um, we talk a little bit about file upload and download. The, the common problems that are seen are that file uploads happen in in bad directories or on the server. All right. Cross-site request forgery, make sure they're using some type of cross-site request forgery mitigation in the framework. They all have them. Uh, authorization and authentication, make sure you're looking at those interceptors or the places where authentication and authorization occur because you can find back doors, right? Where the developer says dev mode equals true and all authentication is turned off. Race conditions, all right? This is really quick. A lot of frameworks have singletons. By default, can anyone tell me what the question mark, what is a bad value for the question mark or the question marks? And there's a little hint in the bottom. What would, what, would, what would that be called? What question mark? ID, right? Username, role, right? So does anyone know why this is bad when if the, if the action class is a singleton? There's going to be multiple threads that are going to be calling execute at the same time, and there's only one instance variable for the class, right? So you could have two threads that come in to execute, set the role, the latter role gets set by an admin, and the first thread now becomes an admin and starts executing his code, all right? All right, exposed objects in these frameworks. If you make them public, they're callable via URL. As long as you know what to put in the URL, you can call those public methods because it's convention over configuration. All right, we went over that bang thing. Okay, here, this is kind of interesting, struts two. The bang executes with the privileges of execute, not the method that's being called. So if execute is a public method, an internal admin is a admin method, you can use the bang to get around your authorization. All right, there's other ways to expose methods over HTTP friendly protocol. Each framework has a way of exposing objects directly. All right, and then we have some configuration things. Okay, I, I don't have a lot of time, so what I want to do is I want to get to the thing that um, is really important, combined threads. Billy Rios talked about this on the client side. He talked about how you can combine these minor kind of things that don't look threatening into something really bad. And you can do the same thing on the server. So what we're going to do is we're going to talk about file disclosure, getting any file on the server, combined with a file upload to cause a remote shell. All right, so let's go through that demo. This is the last thing I'm going to do, so just hang in with me. All right, so we're going to go ahead and upload a file. Now, The developer who, who wrote this application forgot that JSPF files are JSP files. Okay, so he wrote a whitelist and said, okay, no JSP, no ASP, no uh, JSPX, but forgot JSPF. All right? So now the attacker can upload a JSPF file. Now we've uploaded it. So if you want to see what that file looks like, let's just quickly take a look at that. The JSPF file basically takes the request parameter, passes it to runtime exec, gets the output, displays it back on the screen. All right? It's a pretty common thing. Luca had a, a similar thing in one of his talks. All right. So I've uploaded this file. Now, if we look at the file upload logic, Where does this file get uploaded to? When you're looking at code, you've got to see this. When you're looking at file upload code, this is one of the things you've got to be looking for. So it gets to WebINF, right? And what do developers think? They think WebINF is safe, right? They think, oh, no one can access this from the outside. So what? 
All right, but what did we learn today, right? That's not necessarily true. Now, if we go to the file system, let's, let's go ahead and, and try to now execute this file so it's in WebINF uploads. All right, so I got to the file now. All right, by using the file disclosure. Remember this thing we, we discussed in the beginning, the file disclosure? That allows me to get into the web INF directory and call any file. And that code that was doing the file upload was uploading the files into the web INF uploads directory, so I just called it now. All right, so I can execute any command now. I got a remote command shell into the server. Okay? So how much time do I got left? Zero? All right. Um, all right, so this is the details of that. And I just wanted to get uh, through that. Does anybody have any questions? We covered a lot of stuff today. I have, if you're looking for more details, um, I have a white paper that's 68 pages, single spaced, on the Black Hat website that was presented. Yes, questions? Or, okay. Well, thank you very much, and I uh, hope you enjoy the rest of the Bay Threat. Hey guys, uh, so once she's almost set up, I'll ask you to just give it another five minutes and then line up uh, on this side and then merge with the other line. And this way we'll be able to